Welcome to Tech Art Academy. Unreal Engine 5.1 just dropped, and it's massive. But is it any good? Let's find out. There are way too many changes for me to cover in a single video, but I've done my best to cover all the major features, and I think this is pretty comprehensive. As expected, there are performance improvements with a focus on creating next-gen titles at 60 FPS. The three major features that improve both graphical fidelity and performance are Lumen, Nanite, and Virtual Shadow Maps. So we're starting with the improvements to Lumen. Lumen now supports the two-sided foliage shading model by gathering lighting from the back face and scattering it to the leaf. Here's an example. The biggest change from 5 to 5.1 is the ability to simulate accurate lighting. You can see how the shadows are darker in 5 compared to 5.1, and a big part of the realism comes from the shadows, but also because of the subsurface scattering. In real life, light passes through and bounces off of leaves, so the ability to simulate this makes the lighting much more realistic. Another huge improvement is Lumen's software ray tracing, which allows for a much more accurate representation of foliage through stochastic, semi-transparent distance field ray traces. The main winding was of the normal Lotus O deltoid type placed in panendermic semi-boloid slots of the stator. <laughs> which just means it fixes over-occlusion on foliage. The other major upgrades to Lumen are high global illumination and high quality translucency reflections, which allows for 60 FPS with global lighting improved bounce lighting, and improved reflections. Previously, high-performance dynamic bounce lighting didn't work with translucent materials, but now it does. So let's see this in action. If you turn high-quality translucency reflections on, you can tell the difference right away, both on the vehicle itself and the material that's here. Now you can actually see the building reflecting, and since it's working with translucency now, you can simultaneously look through it to see the vehicle behind it. And just looking at this, you can see a massive improvement from what it used to be. And then if you turn it on and off, you can just see again how incredible the difference is. So I think this is a pretty awesome feature. The difference is night and day. And you can actually see the reflections of the buildings and the trees in the windows and the mirrors. But there is one drawback. This does make a huge difference graphically, but it also has a hit to performance. And a lot of people have reported noticing the difference. So that's something to consider. So, we've seen this new feature with glass reflections, but I want to show you how it works with water too. You used to have to use planar reflection and carefully put it in place to line up with your water material. But now you can just turn the setting on and it applies it automatically. Overall, I think this is a pretty big deal in terms of both graphical improvements and how easily it can be applied. Now I want to show you examples of lumen improvements with global illumination. Previously, the bounce lighting had to rely on a voxel approximation, but now it is able to bounce lighting directly off the material itself, which creates far more realistic and accurate bounce lighting. This also increases the overall illumination and creates less noise, meaning the lighting is much less distorted and cleaner, and this improves the look of the shadows and fixes inaccurate occlusion. This is a great example of the noise change. In the original version, you can see quite a bit of noise, but in the new version, it's super clean. As we've seen, the lumen improvements also have a major effect on shadows, so I wanted to also cover virtual shadow mapping. It does allow for much more accurate and better looking shadows, but the drawback is, you guessed it, performance. In this example, adding trees packed densely together could result in massive hits in performance. That's because virtual shadow maps are really slow and only work well when a significant portion of the on-screen shadows are cached across multiple frames. As you can see, that isn't the case here. It has to be recalculated every frame. In 5.0, this was an issue, but it is much more performant now. That's pretty much it for Lumen, but before I move on to the improvements to Nanite, I just want to briefly cover the drawbacks of Nanite. Overall, I think Nanite is a massive improvement, and in most use cases, it's what you would want to use but just so you're aware, there are specific cases where Nanite could use improvement, and hopefully it will be accounted for in future releases. This specific example is related to meshes, and you can see that we have a Nanite mesh group and a non-Nanite mesh group. When adjusting the UV scale and displacement, it doesn't work as well with Nanite as the non-Nanite version. You can't tell as much with the sphere, but it becomes more apparent as we move down the line. With the cube, it doesn't work well because it causes non-uniform distortion. Whereas with the non-nanite version, you can see that the distortion is essentially uniform. Um, 
so that's just something to keep in mind. When attempting to change the position without deforming the mesh or the object, it works really well. Basically, we have a sign value that we are animating and we modify that with a scaler and modify that with vertex normals and then it's fed into a world position offset. And as you can tell, in this case it works really well. There's really no difference between the two. So in the next example, we're essentially trying to do the same thing, but we want to deform the mesh just a little bit. Um, and when trying to do that with the nanite, it just doesn't work very well because of the uniformity of the mesh. This is really good for performance, but if you were trying to deform this slightly to create a sort of water ripple effect, then the nanite wouldn't be a good option. So you can see on the left side that it's not really deforming properly. On the right side, you can see the ripple effect. But with nanite, it's really only accounting for maximum performance. In contrast, in this next example, when creating effects for grass, both the nanite and non-nanite version look really good. And this is specifically when attempting to create wind animation. But obviously, in this example, the nanite version, even though they look about the same, the nanite version is just a lot more performant. So this will be really good moving forward. And that brings us to the nanite improvements that we can expect to see in 5.1. The biggest changes are the improvements to foliage. Previously, nanite was not applied to foliage, but now it can be and still works while blowing in the wind like we saw earlier. Also, the use of nanite masks makes it more accessible for creators to apply nanite however they choose and allows them to program the behavior of a specific material. I think the most important and game-changing feature is preserve area applied to the foliage. So how it works is that all geometry is made up of polygons, and the more you have, the more detail is available. But that will also make it take longer to process. When dealing with large environments, for a long time it was impossible to keep the same graphical fidelity across all geometry, or everything in the game, without destroying performance. This was mitigated through the use of level of detail, or LOD. It used to take forever to implement different levels or layers of detail that would use less and less polygons the further away from the camera the object was. That way only the stuff you were close enough to see the details on would be rendering a high level of detail and stuff in the background would essentially be cardboard cutouts. You're about to see the switch. If you were watching carefully, you would notice that the trees in the background and especially the shadows have a huge difference. And that's because the stuff that was further away in the distance was just billboards and the shadows don't render properly because they're not actual 3D objects. But with the level of detail replaced by nanite, everything in the scene is now real geometry that exists in the world. Hopefully that all made sense. If not, we have another example here that'll give you a better idea because you can see it up close and far away and we have more control to see how nanite affects the foliage. You can see much more clearly here how the further we get away, the more billboards show up, and transitioning between billboard to the 3D object is pretty noticeable, but with nanite, that's totally different. So this is where you would go to actually apply this new setting, and then that was applied to this whole environment, so when we look in here, we'll see how big of a difference it is. As you move back and forth, you can see that the billboards don't pop up, and the detail is maintained all the way through. And also, because the detail is maintained regardless of distance, it also makes it so that the shadows show up correctly. Another important update with 5.1 is that Nanite now requires the shader model 6 to run with DirectX 12, which is now the default. A few other notable additions to Nanite are the ability to convert and render landscapes using Nanite, and users can now enable native support for ray and path tracing using a setting within the release notes. But the most important part of the video by far is coming up right about now. I find your lack subscribers of disturbing. Enough of this. World Partition has been upgraded heavily to support large world coordinates, which allows users to create massive worlds without loss of precision, and users now have access to accelerated source control workflows with World Partition. This is largely due to the upgrades to search in terms of managing, filtering, change lists, and viewing files. 
It used to be a lot more difficult to find what you were looking for in general, not to mention when dealing with high volume in terms of objects and overall world scale, but now things are much easier in this regard. Now you have full control of breadth and depth of references and dependencies. You can bring it up and down and set a limit, which makes searching through your reference tree much cleaner and simpler. You can even use collections to filter your references. In addition, everything is color-coded, so you can tell between blueprints, splines, etc. And this allows you to see what you're dealing with at a glance, instead of having to zoom back and forth. This is similarly applied to the light mixer. You now have access to all of your lights in your level in one area, and you can choose how many you want to see if you are focusing on a small group or one at a time. This also makes it far easier when dealing with content-rich environments with a lot of different developers. In this world partition map in Lyra, we can save all of them without checking out, and instead make them writable. You used to have to keep track of this while using your source control, but now you can view all of your change lists in one area, and all of it is searchable and sortable, and users now have access to a default uncontrolled change list. This allows you to track files that you don't have checkout permission on, but instead have modify permission on for locally writable files. This way, if you were in a workflow using one file per actor, and another user is also working with those files, or your source control goes down, you can continue your work and then just reconcile or revert, which makes managing large amounts of files and assets within Unreal far easier. I briefly mentioned landscapes and Nanite, but I want to show you how it looks in action. So this is an environment where we have it turned on, but we're going to go in and click Rebuild Data, and then it will build out the landscape using Nanite data. As you can see, it's not perfect. When it initially renders, it does look a little bit weird, but all it takes is some adjusting, and you can get it looking really nice fairly quickly. So if you look closely, you can see some weird stretching going on with the mesh, but like I said, you can clean that up and you can use essentially the same tools you would use without Nanite to help fix it up. So let's do that now. So as you can see, it's looking better now. Um, and there is some more adjusting that would need to be done. For example, if you zoom out, you can see um, how it's weird around the edges. So that's something that we need to, would need to be adjusted as well, which we can also fix that fairly quickly. So that's looking pretty good right there. And then we would just hit validate and that's getting pretty close. It's not completely finished though. At this point, um, if you try to go to Nanite to look at it, um, you'd see that it was off. So you have to go back in and readjust it and then it'll be good to go. Then once it rebuilds the data and the shader, this is what it looks like. So it does take it a minute for it to adjust, but once you zoom out and zoom back in, it's looking pretty good. So overall, it's a pretty cool feature, and uh, we'll look at it more in the future. On to the next functionality regarding world partition. There have been significant improvements to data layers. This includes the level instance support, data layer outliner, and the data layer functionality. This is now split into sections, which consists of the data layer asset for storing data layers, and the layer instances that reference a data layer asset, which is world specific. Here's a visual of how data layer improvements work. Data layers help when dealing with large multi-layered environments that need to contain different assets. This instance contains three. There is an environment one, a gameplay, and a lighting layer. Previously, these were specific to a level, so your level or world would have X amount of data layers. Now you have data layer instances, which reference data layer assets. This means you can have data layers that exist in multiple maps. You just reference them from your instance, meaning you can create shared content between multiple levels without having to recreate the data layers or duplicate anything. This results in a much cleaner workflow. Users also have access to the actor editor context, which means when working in world partition, you can see your world partition data layer, level instance, and your outliner active folder. So as you can see, this makes dealing with layers much easier. Overall, it's really useful. Now I want to talk about the new hierarchical level of detail, or HLOD. This is now supported for water rendering and streaming. This allows users to create large bodies of water with better performance and a smaller memory footprint. 
This definitely comes in handy, especially if you are also using high quality translucency reflections, which allows you to get realistic reflections without using screen space. When using screen space, you can see artifacting on the edges, but when the effect is applied, it becomes seamless. Now for translucent overlay material improvements. You can now assign static and skeletal meshes a secondary overlay material. You can use this to achieve certain visual effects without requiring a duplicate mesh. The mesh will be rendered twice, once with a base material and once with a translucent overlay material. There is only one overlay material per mesh regardless of the number of material slots, allowing for shading effects that span across the entire mesh in one pass. I'm sure plenty of you will be happy to hear this next one. On-demand shader compilation, or ODSC, compiles only the shaders needed to render what is seen on screen in the editor, and during iterative platform development using Cook on the Fly. ODSC can significantly reduce the number of shaders to be compiled for those who routinely sync their builds and have a large number of shaders to compile, those who iterate on materials and shaders often, and for anyone without access to remote DDC for cache shaders. This is enabled by default and can be controlled with the CVAR r.shadercompiler.jobcache.ddc so, that one is pretty much self-explanatory. From now on, we'll have to do a lot less waiting around for shaders to compile and spend more time actually working. The next feature is an experimental one. It's the anamorphic depth of field and camera crop. So, the idea behind this feature is to allow the camera to be much more cinematic and more realistically emulate an actual anamorphic camera lens. This is really about getting a good depth of field effect. As you can see, the lights are far behind the subjects, so when the compression happens, we can get a nice bokeh effect. And this doesn't yet fully give the full effect of a real anamorphic lens. You would need three things. A squeeze effect, meaning the depth of field. Some kind of lens distortion, typically fairly subtle, but still noticeable. And the third thing would be lens flares. This will allow it to be a fully featured anamorphic lens, which obviously it's still experimental, so they're not there yet, but hopefully they keep this and improve on it. You also now have the option to access the C++ header and I think C Sharp header for blueprint features. Basically what this does is if you are interested in translating your blueprints to code, you can now easily do that. And not only do you have the ability to translate blueprints to C++, um, I think you can also do it with C-sharp as well, so that's pretty exciting, but don't quote me on that. So pretty much what this does is it generates a header preview showing you headers for all of your variables, functions, active components, etc. And it gives you a framework to work from and provides a head start in your transition from blueprints to actual code. Another feature that's not really sexy, but is actually pretty exciting is just the project structure in 5.1. You can see now that there's a proper hierarchical folder view, which means when you're scrolling down, folders that you're currently looking at pin to the top, and when you click on them, it will bounce back to that folder, which makes scrolling through huge piles of assets way easier than before. For instance, we can just bounce back to areas without having to scroll all the way back. This is way easier on the mouse wheel, easier on your fingers, and just easier on your sanity. Beyond that, the search capabilities have been significantly upgraded within the outline of the content browser and several parts of the toolset. Search history is now available, so your most recent handful of searches will be stored in your search bar so you can bring them back up real quickly if you need to. And there's now support for more complex searching than before, so you have an easier time finding exactly what you're looking for, and if you have a specific search that you find particularly useful, you can even save the search for quick access. So like I said, not really a sexy feature like Lumen, but game changing nonetheless. Alright, now it's time to get into modeling improvements. Originally introduced in 5.0 as experimental, the UV editor, which is currently in beta, is now available as a built-in tool instead of having it as a plugin, which is really nice. The UV editor ships with tools for layout, unwrapping, transforming, splitting, aligning, and also UV with additional support for 3D viewport camera snapping to selection. You can also pin existing UV islands to the UDIM they currently occupy while undergoing layout or unwrapping operations. There are other details I won't get into, but there are a lot of improvements that will definitely be exciting for people who are creating 3D models inside Unreal Engine. The pattern tool expands the artist modeling toolkit by allowing you to tile one or more selected meshes along a line, grid, or circle 
oriented on a movable 3D plane. Various parameters are available for each tiling pattern, including interpolating translation, rotation, and scale. Animators now have an experimental LM Deformer framework, as well as a reusable asset type editor that you can use to train, inspect, and debug ML Deformer models that deform meshes by evaluating the networks at runtime. Additionally, you can enable a new Neural Morph Model plugin to use a fabricated high-performance deformer model to train high-quality deformations on your characters with a low memory footprint. The Pose Search plugin now features the new Motion Matching Animation Blueprint node, a dynamic alternative to state machines. You can use it to build character locomotion animation systems. Using a database asset containing the character's locomotion animations, the Motion Matching node makes informed animation pose decisions from a set of stored animations to match the character's movement model at runtime. Using the motion matching node, a high quality responsive character locomotion animation system can be set up quickly and efficiently without the need for complex state machine logic. The Deformer Graph plugin features an editor that allows users to create and edit Deformer Graph assets to customize complex mesh vertex deformation behaviors for any skinned mesh. And the Physics Control component is a plugin that provides a means for you to add simple, intuitive, and powerful physically based controls to a blueprint. With these physics controls, you can now take advantage of the emergent physical motion of static and skeletal meshes while still retaining artistic and gameplay control. To improve consistency with other similar blueprint tools, Setup Event was renamed to Construction Event. New spawn nodes were also added to make procedural rig creation in the Construction Event faster and easier. Several quality of life improvements and UX changes to Control Rig were also made to improve workflow. New properties were added that are available when using the IK Retargeter to control the length, width, and splay of IK goals. In most cases, this can be used to adjust the stride and overall stance of a retargeted character. New tools and workflows were added to improve retargeting results from vastly different characters. Foot sliding and other similar problems can be reduced by using speed planting workflows. Similar to constraining methods in other animation tools, you can constrain entire transforms with the parent constraint or along individual channels with translation, rotation, look at, or scale constraints. Constraints make it easier to dynamically and non-destructively attach your object's actors and control rig controls to each other in your sequencer animation. Unreal Engine 5.1 also brings some interesting new physics simulation improvements with Chaos receiving a significant update which includes a new color mode for displaying contextual information based on state and size, removal, damage, and collision. There's also a new runtime damage watcher in the fracture mode which allows users to record viewpoint simulation at runtime. Users can now paint vertex colors and textures on fractured geometry. In addition, vertex colors now propagate on new vertices generated by fractures, providing more consistent behavior of materials using them. It is now possible to use collision from the original static mesh used to build the geometry collection. This provides fine customization of collisions, especially for non-convex shapes. This, alongside a few others, like the new propagation system, removal, convex, validate, auto cluster, and selection tool are all part of the fracture system that exists in Unreal Engine now. Unreal Engine 5.1 includes improvements to its turbulence model and small scale forces. These improvements make it easier to add additional detail to the leading edges of the simulation. This can make the simulation look more natural as the shapes will be displayed more prominently. In a similar vein is tricubic interpolation. This mode was added, which you can use to add extra details without increasing the overall resolution of the simulation. This results in a more detailed simulation at a similar cost to simulations in a previous version of Unreal Engine. There are also some interesting updates for closed simulation and improvements for GPU ribbons. The main standout is that you can now choose between doing your rendering on CPU or GPU instead of being locked to CPU. There are also some cool improvements to scalability emitter versioning, and a few experimental and beta tools like heterogeneous volumetric rendering. Alright, on to the AI improvements. So, the new update to AI is still in the experimental stage, but from what I can see already, it makes a huge difference. It makes the whole process just a lot faster. Before the 5.1 update, it would take either a plug-in or just a lot more manual work to add this, but now you can throw them in there, they can be working, and they're also actually pretty smart. They don't just bump into each other, they have detection. So yeah, pretty exciting, pretty good system overall. 
So what this new feature is called is Mass Entity, and it's a data-driven mass calculation that allows you to have massive cities with tens of thousands of characters in there all working at once, which is pretty insane. Next is Smart Objects. They received a general stability and workflow improvement that makes it more convenient to set up smart definitions. And one of the main use cases for Smart Objects is the ability to create meaningful gameplay interactions during gameplay. And for this reason, Smart Objects received initial experimentation support for the Gameplay Interactions plugin. They plan to continue improving in future versions with the goal of embedding gameplay interactions into Smart Objects that will combine state trees and contextual animations with replication support. So this is a brief look at the Audio Niagara particle system in action. And audio modulation is no longer a beta feature, it's now fully integrated with Metasound. And this provides a generic method for modulating audio parameters. Now anything can be a modulation source or destination, and you can define your own groups or parameters and control them how you want. Um, there's a lot of other cool sound stuff as well. There's audio gameplay volumes are the next iteration in geometry-based audio management and control, designed as a replacement for legacy audio systems. Soundscape, which procedurally generates ambient sounds, such as rustling foliage, chirping birds, and bustling traffic, and they're streamlined as the player moves around the world. Once set up, the plugin manages and composes these sound systems autonomously and removes the need to manually create them. That's pretty awesome. Also, there's a waveform editor beta, so you can edit the waveform. That's really useful. If you've ever done editing, you know that being able to see the waveform makes a huge difference when trying to edit. So anyway, there's a lot of cool features with sound. Those are just some of them. So the last thing I want to cover is some really cool features in VR. Um, if you walk up to this in VR, you can see just how much detail. And you can also use Nanite, which before you couldn't use that in VR, and now you can. So that's a big part of the reason why there's so much detail. And obviously it's going to be different when you have a headset on versus just seeing it on screen. But it's pretty intense. And also you can use Lumen in VR now as well. So all the lighting here, none of it is baked in. It's all real-time lighting and you can tell from the shadows how good it looks in VR and also you can just see all the little details if you take your time to look around with the environment so it's a, actually a massive improvement and a pretty big deal that all this is able to run in VR now all right so that's pretty much all I wanted to cover as far as the main features go I could continue but there's just so much documentation that it could take forever so, if you want to look at yourself, there's a link in the description, but let's be honest, if you wanted to read, you wouldn't be here watching this video. So, just let me know in the comments what you're most excited about as far as features go, and also let me know what features you'd like me to cover more in depth. And if you could like and subscribe, that'd be awesome, because I have 10 subscribers, so that'd make a huge difference. I hope you enjoyed the video. This is Tech Art Academy signing off. Have a great day and stay educated.